Hi, and welcome to another time of worship with First Baptist Church, Dartmouth. We have a wonderful God, a loving God, a faithful God, a God that goes with us all the time, who never abandons us. And now we are invited to come into his presence, to glorify his name, and to be transformed by him. As we begin our worship together, let's come before his throne of grace in prayer. Come thou fount of every blessing. God, I pray that you would tune my heart to sing your praise. You are so faithful. You are so good. Even in our failings, you never leave us or forsake us. You are always ready to forgive and always prepared to redeem. So fill us as we worship you. Guide and direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us pray. John, 1 John 5, 11 says, And God's testimony is this, that he has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. God's testimony is his Son. Father God, what an amazing thing it is that you have spoken to us in your Son and that you did not just send him in word only, but you sent him as a person who lived among us for three years and recorded it so carefully and then gave us his spirit, your spirit, who testifies to us of the Son. What a high calling we have to also testify to the Son and reveal to the world the amazing love of God manifest in Jesus Christ who so loved us that he was willing to die on the cross for us so that we could be forgiven our sin and have fellowship, have relationship with Father God. We humbly bow before you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We rejoice that you have welcomed us into your family. We can't even understand and are amazed. It's beyond us to understand this, but we simply receive it by faith. And we stand up, we rise up to take the calling that you have for us. That we might represent you in this world and show Father's love to everyone we meet. There's much tribulation in our world, Lord. There's much tribulation in our city. There's much tribulation in our individual lives. We all face challenges. But we have you who promise to walk us through each and every circumstance of life as we hold tightly to you. As we set our eyes upon you, you promise to meet us to fill us, to supply our need. Lord, as we go into this next season of life as a church, we look forward to seeing your manifest glory. We look forward to seeing how you are going to shape us and form us to be this body of Christ that loves the world, that walks in faith, that rejoices in you. 
none of which we could do on our own. But as we open ourselves to you, as we humble ourselves before you, as we recognize that it's not what we do, but it's what you do through us, then you will glorify yourself. We will see you do things that we know that we could never, ever do. And it will cause such joy to rise up. We will be a testimony to the world of Father, Son, and Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come into our fellowship to do in us what needs to be done that we might accomplish the things that Father has for us to do as a church and as individuals. Help us to run this race that is set before us, setting our eyes on Jesus, the the one who is the master, the one who completes, the one who satisfies, the one who accomplishes all to do with kingdom. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask, think, or imagine, to you be the glory in Christ Jesus, now and forevermore. Amen. We're continuing in the book of Joshua. In fact, this will be the last chapter and the last part of Joshua uh, in our series, Joshua 24. And we wanted to end the series with this chapter because it's also the end of the chapter for Joshua. After the speech that we're going to hear him give to his people, we're going to find out that he passes on and he'll have to pass the mantle on to another leader. But before Joshua passes on, he decides that he needs to remind the people to have a look back at their history and to remind them of two essential things. First, he wants them to remember the importance of their history. And secondly, he wants to remind them that every day they need to be committed to making a commitment to God above everything else. Then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River. And they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor, Abraham, from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt, and afterward I brought you out as a free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and charioteers. When your ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes you saw what I did. Then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Finally, I brought you into the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you. And so I rescued you from Balak. When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. 
but I give you victory over them. And I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It was not your sword or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns you did not build. The towns where you are now living, I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then you choose today who you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served before beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The people replied, We would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. Then Joshua warned the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins if you abandon the Lord and serve other gods. He will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. But the people answered Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. You are a witness to your own decision, Joshua said. You are chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied. We are witnesses to what we have said. All right, then, Joshua said. Destroy the idols amongst you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God. We will obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with them that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded all these things in the book of God's instructions. As a reminder of their agreement, he took a huge stone and rolled it beneath the terebinth tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, This stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. It will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. Then Joshua sent all the people away to their homeland. So what does it mean for us to look back in order to move forward? Uh, there are times when looking back is not a good thing. You just remember uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah story uh, where someone looked back and they were turned into salt because they were not supposed to look back. But that type of looking back was all about longing for something that God never wanted them to have initially or even longing for a past that was never going to be part of the new beginning. But there is a type of looking back in order for us to move forward well that is important. And Joshua talks about that. And it's all around the importance of the history of Israel. Throughout the history of Israel, we hear these words in the Torah, remember, pass on from generation to generation, never forget. And so it's not about carrying forward certain forms, but it's a remembering the faithfulness of God, God's faithfulness, God's awesome acts of wonder, his miracles in the past to encourage us moving forward. And so we see that the very first thing we want to remember and that Joshua does in verse 2 to 13, he wants to rehearse the story of God's faithfulness. In fact, the way Joshua words it in, 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 verse, in verse 2 is to say, this is what God is saying to us. I was the one that set Abraham up. I was the one that brought you out of Egypt. I was the one, I was the one. God's faithfulness. This is why we worship him today. It's why we get, put our trust in him. Because he has shown himself over and over 
to be faithful, to be just, to be gracious. We do not want to forget all that God has done for us in our history. And so throughout our moving forward, we must make sure that we mark our times, not just on the Sabbath day, but on special days as we move forward. Mark those moments where we continue to say, remember when God did this for us. Have you started marking those moments, those God moments, those special moments? Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So the first thing we want to remember to do is we want to look back into our history and remember, retell the stories of God's faithfulness. But there's a second component of looking back, and this is a bit of a harder one. It's not just about God's faithfulness. We also have to be reminded about where we have not always been faithful to God. This is, as I said, a bit of a harder one. But if you look at verses 14 and 15, part of what Joshua does in these verses is he says, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. But then he says this, put away forever the idols, your ancestors. So he's going back in history. Your ancestors worshipped. In verse 19, he says, and Joshua warned the people, you are not able to serve the Lord for he is holy and a jealous God. I almost have in mind Joshua remembering where they uh, turned to the golden calf, remembering all their whining, wanting to go back to Egypt, their faithlessness, while God was always faithful. We want to review those lessons we've learned. My dad used to call them the, the school of hard, of, of hard knocks. And the bigger question is, will we learn from our history? Or will we make the same mistakes over and over again? You know, COVID has taught us a lot. I believe that COVID has shown us again God's faithfulness but I think it's also taught us some really good lessons. It's taught us that we have not kept Sabbath well. And in fact, COVID provided that opportunity for us to re-examine uh, re what Sabbath means and the importance of Sabbath and rest. COVID showed us that our land needed a rest from all the pollution. COVID reminded us that we were not able anymore to rely on buildings or even forms of worship or how we did communion or baptism. And yet it didn't mean that we, we couldn't worship and glorify God. And in fact, it showed us that sometimes we made our buildings and our forms of worship and even our denominational ways into idols. And so Joshua says... Turn away from the idols. Turn away from our rebellious ways of the past. I really believe that even as, as Christ followers, we can intentionally and unintentionally turn his blessings into God's. 
into idols. And so we want to ask ourselves this question. Where in our recent past have our buildings, our form of worship, even our love for denomination, our rituals, even our work, our money, our family, our children, where have they turned from the blessings of God into idols, into things we begin to worship? Anything that does not draw us to the heart of the Father and to the character of Jesus Christ and that comes from the mighty spirit that is God's, anything that does not draw us in those three ways have become idols. We have turned his blessings into idols. Any tools that have been tarnished because we, we become obsessed with them instead of becoming obsessed with the giver of all life, Jesus. That's what we mean. That's what Joshua means. And so we want to ask a couple of questions. What are the ancestral idols that we might be tempted to carry with us into the promised land? I want you to take time in, the, in your week to ask yourself that question. Why don't you bring all your ancestral possessions before God? All the things that you've learned, that you hold valuable, that you love. That doesn't mean they're bad things, but you bring them before God so that they don't become the gods and idols that will move us as a community away from being followers of Jesus. So bring them before God, lay them at his feet, allow God to speak to you. When he speaks to you, he's gonna speak words of love about who he is and how he created you. And as he does that, he's hoping that you will trust in him. And as you trust in him, you will release all things, your family, your kids, your denomination, your hobbies, your work, your money, all things. You will release them to him and he will do with them as he pleases. But as he does that, you will find all the goodness and all the blessing that are stored up for you and for me. So in Joshua 14, he points out that we can have these ancestral possessions that become, can become gods. In verse 15, he says that we can have cultural things. Listen, or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living? In the land that we are now living, what are the cultural things that have become gods and idols for us? Will you again take time this week to bring all of the cultural things, all the things that surround you culturally, your TV and your, your, you just name it, all of these things. Again, they're not bad things in themselves, but they can become gods and idols when they draw us away from our Father, from the character of Christ, and from the power of His Spirit. Everything is sacred, but all things can lose its giftedness and be turned into gods and idols. 
And so we want to take a look back, not because we want to drag the past with us, but so that we remember first and celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And the second part of looking back is so that we can learn from our mistakes, our sin, so that those sins don't continue to be idols and gods as we move forward. But there's a second component that Joshua wants us to do, and that's this recommitment, making Christ as our center, allowing his spirit to empower us so that we can serve others. Joshua says in verse 15, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Isn't it interesting that at the end of Joshua's time, this was the whole essence of what life meant for him putting his whole faith and trust in the Lord, no matter what anybody else around him chose to do, he and his family were going to serve the Lord. As we move forward, where do we need to commit every day, every week, every month and every year Reminding ourselves that Christ must be center of everything we do, of all we have, of all we're going to be. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Would you take time this week to, to sit with yourself and God and then maybe draw someone else in? And, and if it's not family, then draw a friend in. Find those places where you can make recommitments to our God this week so that we move forward remembering what God has done for us learning from the sins of our past and always seeing that Christ is the center as we serve him. As I said, we're going to move away from the book of Joshua and we've really only touched some, some of the areas. I really would invite you on your holidays or throughout the summer, go back in the book of Joshua. There are many things to learn from this book. Go back and, and study them. But I, I pray that this has given you a thirst, a thirst for, for knowing that you can trust God and, and that God loves you and he goes before you. But he calls you to be part of his big plan of blessing this world. So where are we gonna go after this? Well, we're gonna transition from the Joshua stories of the Old Testament and, and this idea of, of next chapter identifying who we are. And now we're gonna jump into the New Testament and look at our values. We're gonna make some value statements. In fact, um, you're going to see in your email, we're gonna send you out a, a set of value statements that the launch team has put together. The launch team is a group that has been working with me as we try to figure out who we're supposed to be and what we're going to be doing in this new area up at Lancaster. And we're gonna be inviting you uh, into that plan and hopefully hear some of your ideas of how we, how, how we do that. But we wanna make sure that we know who we are, our identity, the values that we go with, and then of course our mission, which uh, we've said before, we are a Christ-centered family, empowered by His Spirit to serve our neighbors, as we are being transformed and as we see transformation in our world. So we want to move forward biblically and we're gonna look at, at, at the Philippians uh, passages in the next four weeks. As we look at our mission statement, Christ-centered family, and as we delve in to the values that we wanna carry forward that should come out of the Bible 
uh, Philippians and other New Testament passages. We have some homework that we want to give you. Here's the homework, and I hope you don't mind. I know you're on holiday, but I hope you'll do a bit of summer homework with us because we want to work together. I'm not supposed to be feeding you like babies. Uh, you're mature adults, and I hope that you would want to grow with me and learn together. So here's some of the homework. First, would you commit to beginning to read Philippians even before uh, we begin the series next week? Go ahead and start reading Philippians uh, all the way through. Secondly, would you prayerfully familiarize yourself with these following statements? You know our mission statement, the Christ-centered family, but now familiar, familiarize yourself with that statement as well as these new value statements. And then we want you to ponder these questions. Are the values that we talk about in our mission statement and our value statements, and even in our logo, are they similar to those that you read in the words of Jesus and in the New Testament? As you read Philippians, why don't you go ahead and make a list? What are the values that you see highlighted? And how do these values in this letter match up with what you find, with what we say of who we are? Well, I hope that you'll join us on this continued um, journey forward as we grow together in discipleship, as we learn together, as we move from Joshua into Philippians. More than that, I pray that we will find that as we look back, we will say thank you, God, for seeing us through. I pray that we will say thank you, God, for forgiving us of our past sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness and let go of the gods and idols that have been our past. And I pray, just like Joshua, that you and I will continue every single day and every week when we gather for worship and every month and every year, we will say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May we so be blessed so that we can bless nations to come. Amen.
Again, I want to thank you for joining us for this time of worship. Worship doesn't end here. We can continue to worship God all throughout this week. So I pray that you'll find many places to be so thankful, to be so generous because of who God is. A quick reminder that our next in-person worship service together at the Best Western will be Sunday, August the 8th. It will also be our communion Sunday. Ellen Shaw has already begun to register people, so please make sure you get your name on the list and so we can prepare well to meet together August the 8th, 1030 Best Western. As we end, we end with a benediction from Joshua 1 verse 9, played by hope. As we go, may we go with confidence and with courage because our God goes before us and with us. Amen. Oh,